A very good morning to all of you. I'm so glad we can meet virtually, even in the midst of a lockdown. Today, I'm going to share with you a message which I trust will be relevant to you, even as you struggle through this pandemic. My sermon is entitled, Tap into God's Provision. Now, the first thing you need to know is that as soon as you became a Christian, God promises to provide for all your needs. That is an undeniable fact. Philippians chapter 4, 19 says, And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from His glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Just like a father cares for his children, God provides for His children. Now, God provides for us even when you are not aware of it. In fact, John Piper says, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, but you may be aware of only three of them. There was a story told of an old woodcutter who bought a chainsaw because he heard that a chainsaw could cut wood much faster than his axe. But a few days later, he returned the chainsaw to the shop saying, Hey, I can cut more wood with my axe than I can with this thing. Now the salesman checked the chainsaw and found that everything is in order. Then he pulled the starter cord and the chainsaw roared to life. The old woodcutter jumped back and exclaimed, Hey, what's that noise? You know, the woodcutter had all the power in that chainsaw, but he didn't know how to turn on the machine. In the same way, God has provided everything pertaining to life and godliness. Some people don't know how to tap onto the power of God. Today, let's learn how to turn on the chainsaw. First of all, let's watch the animated story from the Bible Project on how God provided for Jacob and his family as they went through a terrible famine in the land. A situation not unlike the pandemic which we are all going through right now. Now it's this last part of the book, the story of Jacob's sons, where all the themes come to a head. Jacob loves his second to youngest son, Joseph, more than any of the others, and he gives him this special jacket. And the ten older sons come to hate Joseph, and so they kidnap him, and they plan to kill him, but instead they decide to just sell him into slavery in Egypt, where he ends up in prison. Talk about family failure. But God is with Joseph, and he orchestrates Joseph's release from prison, and Pharaoh ends up elevating Joseph to second in command over all of Egypt. And so Joseph saves the nation of Egypt during a famine, and he also ends up saving his brothers and his family from starving to death. And so once again, we can see the folly and the sin of Abraham's family is met with God's faithfulness, who subverts even the evil of the brothers into an occasion to save life. And this is actually what Joseph says right near the end of the book. He says to his brothers, you all planned this for evil, but God planned it for good to save many lives. Now, I believe there are four, three keys to unlocking God's provision for your life. The first, believe in his promises. Number two, act on his promises. And number three, focus on the sun. Now, let's go to the first point, which is believe in his promises. Now, Genesis chapter 45, verse 26, they told him Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is the ruler of all Egypt. Jacob was stunned and he did not believe them. Now, obviously, Jacob did not believe his sons because 22 years ago, his sons had told him that Joseph had been killed by wild animals. His mind had been conditioned to believe that Joseph was dead. Furthermore, Jacob's sons did not have a great track record for honesty. But what if Jacob had continued to doubt them? What if he had said, Oh, you're up to no good as usual. You know that Joseph died over 20 years ago, and now you expect me to believe that he's alive and well? No, he would have missed out God's abundant provision through Joseph if he had done that. Before I became a Christian, my mind had been conditioned to believe that the Bible was just a book of myths. I was an avid fan of a well-known atheist, mathematician, and philosopher named Burton Russell. I be he believed there was no life after death, and I was so influenced by him that when one of my classmates tried to convert me to Christianity, 
I gave her a copy of Burton Russell's book, Why I Am Not a Christian. If I had continued to doubt the good news that Christ died for me, I would never have discovered the joy of knowing Christ and gaining access to all His wonderful promises. But something happened in 1975. My father became very ill and was admitted to hospital. My mom and I were at his bedside and we saw my father take his last breath. As I stood there with great sorrow in my heart, I hugged my mother and made a vow in my heart to find out the purpose of life. I began on a journey to discover Christ and a few years later, I found Jesus. Or rather, He found me. I was a lost sheep but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I not only met my lovely wife through the Christian fellowship in the same firm that we were working in, but also discovered that he had provided for every need in my family through the years. You know, God's provision is in His promises. These promises are provided for us in the Word of God. The promises are our inheritance. They are legally ours. It is like when Joshua entered the promised land. God promised him that every place he steps on would be his. But it was up to Joshua to walk upon it. Now the promises are the expressions of God's will. God never promised anything that was not his will. Derek Prince, one of my favorite Bible teachers, described it in this way. Suppose I have a young son and I say to him, if you sweep the garage out, Put everything in order and do a good job, I'll give you $10. My son agrees and he goes in, sweeps out the garage and does a good job and makes everything neat and orderly. He comes back to me and says, Dad, I want my $10. What would you think of me if I had said, I never meant to give you $10, it wasn't my will. You could write me off as an unreliable and undependable person, a failure as a father. And so it is with the promises of God. Suppose we discover a promise that meets our need and then we obediently fulfill the conditions that God has laid down. If we then come to Him for what He has promised, He will never tell us, It's true, I promised you that, but you know, sorry, I, I never really meant to give it to you. It is not my will. Now such behavior would be very bad. Even in an earthly father, and it would be totally unlike the nature of God as our Heavenly Father. In fact, Jesus Himself told us of the very opposite. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? In Luke chapter 11, verse 13. We see then that the promises of God are really the expressions of His will. The most important thing whenever we pray is to know His will. When we know it's God's will, we can pray with great confidence. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 to 15. Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. In our world today, it's so easy to become pessimistic about things, especially during this pandemic, when the numbers, the COVID-19 numbers just don't seem to go down. A sister told me just this week, she said, I'm so discouraged. We have been praying so hard, and yet the COVID-19 numbers still keep going up. You know, but we must have faith in a good God whose promises are true. Satan's original strategy with Eve was to make, a pessimist, make her a pessimist, to get her to doubt the goodness of God. Today, he's still at work, keeping many of us from experiencing all that God has for us. And uh, he brings disappointment, that Satan brings disappointment and causes us to doubt his, God's promises. And that's the first point, you know. The devil will always try to throw you off balance and cause you to doubt his promises. But the first point is believe in his promises. Now the second point is act on his promises. 
Genesis chapter 45 verse 17, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers, do this, load your animals and return to the land of Canaan, and bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you can enjoy the fat of the land. When Pharaoh invited Jacob and his family to go to Egypt and stay in the best of the land, Jacob did not hesitate even though the journey from Canaan to Egypt is about 300 kilometers. Imagine, immediately, you know, he would have thought, this is crazy, but, you know, he acted on the promise. Now, Jacob was already very old and was probably reluctant. He may die even through that journey, but if he had hesitated, he would have missed out on the great provision of God. If God says to you today, go to the mission field in India, and you say, oh, I'm too old, you will be missing out on the great blessing of God. If you think you're too old to serve, just remember Pastor Patricia, who despite her age, is still going like a train. Because of her great work, we now have planted 10 churches in India. Recently, we embarked on a food distribution program which fed hundreds of families during the pandemic. If you think you're too young to go to the mission field, just look at the life of Jane Elizabeth Falling. She sailed to China as a missionary when she was just 23 years old. And after working in China for five years, Hudson Taylor, whose wife had died earlier, fell in love with her and married her. And that they had two children of their own. Now when Jacob saw the cards that Joseph had sent to carry him, he was convinced and acted on the promises. By acting on the promises that was given by Pharaoh, he was able to experience the abundance which Joseph wanted to provide for him. One of the devil's favorite tactics is to get us to put off to some future moment the thing that we ought to act on now. Procrastination is the devil's favorite tactic to derail the Christian faith. Many times when you are on your way to act on God's promises, the devil does not say no, but he says tomorrow. As a result, you hesitate and often so fail to appropriate the blessing you are praying for. Now, Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Exodus 3, 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to tell the Israelites. I am has sent you. God lives in the now. When you meet God, it is never yesterday and never tomorrow. His name is not I was, nor I will be. It is always I am. M. God is faithful. Don't wait till tomorrow to claim His promises. Claim it now, today. One of the most encouraging Bible verses is this. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread. Psalm 37, 25. Now the third point which is also very important is to focus on the sun. Genesis 45, 28b, My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. See, Jacob saw the carts full of supplies and good things, but he did not say, Hey, look at these wagons. Look at all this cart full of, of goodies. This is wonderful. No, he didn't care about the gifts. Instead, when he knew that Joseph was alive, the Bible says he just wanted to see his son again. All other things were not important. Likewise, all of God's promises are available to us now through Christ. But when we have the Son, we have everything. The Bible says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through Him, the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 1.20 There is only one way to which God makes His promises available to us, Jesus. Did you know that every promise that we claim in the will of God glorifies God? It's true. God has so arranged His promises that when we claim them in His Son's name, He is glorified. And do you know why? You know, Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means that whenever we sin, we rob God of His glory. 
How then do we repay to God the glory that is due to Him? One way is found in Romans chapter 4, verse 20 to 21, where it says about Abraham that he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. So we give back to God the glory that our sin has robbed from Him by believing His promises. The more we claim God's promises, the more we glorify Him. And all His promises are now available through us, through Christ. Don't you want to glorify God? Then have faith and believe His promises. Claim them. Of course, you do not need all of God's promises right now. But any promise you need that fits your situation is available to you right now. Every promise that fits your situation and meets your need is for you now. Likewise, God's purpose in providing for us is not that we would get caught up with all these provisions and gifts. God wants us to be passionate about His Son who died and is alive again. We can appreciate all the good things and gifts God has given us as evidence of His faithfulness. But you know, the most important thing, the most important longing in our hearts should be to be able to see Christ and to be with Him. There was a story told of a rich man who lost his wife when their only child was very young. He hired a housekeeper to care for the boy who lived only into his teens and died. The father was heartbroken and died shortly after. However, no will could be found. And since there were no relatives, it looked as if the state would get his fortune. The man's personal belongings, including his mansion, were put up for sale. The old housekeeper had little money, but there was one thing she wanted. It was a picture that hung on a wall in the house, a photo of the boy she had loved and cared for. When the items were sold, no one wanted the picture. And so she bought it for just a few cents. Taking it home, she began to clean and polish the glass. As she took it apart, a paper fell out. And it was the man's will. And in it, he stated that all his wealth should go to the one who loved his son enough to buy that picture. And she inherited the great fortune. This lovely story is taken from Our Daily Bread from the summer issue of 1983. Now, whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's 1 John 5, 12. God's abundant resources belong to all who trust and love His Son, and the promises of God are all yes in Christ. Our greatest need is to experience more of God, and that is the prayer that God is most delighted to answer you. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you and psalm 37 4 says delight yourself in the lord and he will give you the desires of your heart as we seek the lord and delight ourselves in god all these things will come freely to us always remember that we serve a loving god who is committed to providing for us he says in Exodus 6, 7, You will be my people and I will be your God. Here is a God who is in love with us. We pant after him like the deer in a dry and barren land longs for the water brooks. But did you know that God also pants for us? Paul said this, He loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2, 20. It is not simply that God loves the human race. He loves you individually, personally. He longs for your fellowship. He is involved with you. He delights to see you going to the secret place and beginning to talk to Him. It's you He wants to hear. In summary, James 1.17 reminds us, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Every truly good thing in our lives comes straight from the Father. Let us recap again the three keys of tapping into God's provision. 1. Believe His promises. 2. Act on His promises. 3. Focus on the Son. 
When you turn these three keys, you will unlock the storehouse of God's abundant provisions in your life. Before we end, I'd like to just share with you the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. The verse explains the Bible's message to us in about as simple of terms as can be said. It just simply says that God so loves the world, and that includes you and me and everyone else. So what did God do to show His love? He gave us His one and only Son, Jesus. But what must we do in return? Believe in Jesus, that He is the Son of God. And what is your reward? Eternal life. If you have not received Jesus into your life as Lord and Savior, you have not received the greatest gift of all times, the gift of eternal life. If you would like to receive this gift, just pray the simple prayer with me. Just say Amen at the end of this prayer. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and that I cannot save myself. I receive your gift of salvation. I'm ready to trust you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you are the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead on the third day. Thank you for bearing my sins and giving me the gift of eternal life. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and be my Savior. Amen. If you have said this prayer in your heart and mean it, you have become a child of God. It's as simple as that. The gospel is meant to be so simple. All the promises of God and eternal life now belong to you. Do contact any of the pastors or any church member and we will be most glad to pray for you and to tell you more about Christ and how to grow as a Christian. May God bless you most abundantly. Amen.